kind of focused up front with the car horn going off. And <laughs> well, good to see you tonight. It's good to be here. Did everybody get their uh, tummies full? Yes. No snoring allowed. Steve's not going to allow that. Um, but no, uh, we're, we're, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord together tonight. It's good to see you. Good to see those, uh, those that are visiting with us, back with us tonight. Uh, we're glad that you're here too. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Bible music um, as we worship the Lord. I'm going to ask Reverend Ann Taylor. Reverend Taylor, would you like to say a prayer, please? My Father, your God, we're grateful for this time to get a thank you for the season of the Lord's Day. Lord, I love to hear you teach. He preaches the place in your life. Give him your spirit. Give him the words that he needs, Lord. And help us open our hearts and our minds to your word. And not only a soul of the night and takes with us put it to use of the days to come. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> gather together to magnify the name of the one true God. Now is the time to lift our voices in praise to him. Come. Now is the time to worship. Treasure remains. 
um, the only announcement that I have that I think will be pertinent to, to tonight is looking towards tomorrow night. We are going to have a meal tomorrow night, so plan to come back and uh, <coughs> meet with us again at 5.30. I heard somebody said you had to run in and get here, so we hope uh, that it helped calm down some of the rush in trying to get here tonight. Um, we're going to um, sing a congregational hymn next, uh, but let me just go ahead and introduce um, Reverend Davis to you. Um, most of you all have heard of Reverend Davis this week already, and, uh, but if you haven't been with us, Reverend Davis is the pastor at Spout Springs Church, not far up from us, just down the road at Spout Springs. I remember when there wasn't a Spout Springs. <laughs> I remember it was all sand hills down there. But uh, Steve and his uh, leaders are, are, are leading a big group of folks, a, good, a bunch of folks who are involved in a lot of things, and, and Steve is um, a real, I think, a real teacher at heart. Say, say Steve, uh, but he's been bringing us some dynamic, dynamic messages from the Word, and so we'll be hearing from Reverend Davis as he comes and shares with, with us another message of revival after we stand together and we'll sing a congregation. <laughs>
Okay? So one of my passions is I want you to be all you can be so you can then do all God calls you to do. And we've got a lot of people that we're not giving them the tools to develop into the people God designed them to be. So they can't do the things God designed them to do. And then they get frustrated. And some of you guys may have hit that, hit those marks occasionally, where you're kind of frustrated about, I'd like to do, like to do, and, and you, you can't because, you know, let's go back a different, different analogy would be a tree with its roots. You know, got some trees, shpoop, down they come because they don't have roots. And so I'm a teacher, who said that, I'm a teacher, but I'm passionate and weird. Okay? <laughs> So, so uh, to tell you, 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 you're not, I already knew that, okay, so don't think, you're going to, you're probably going, this guy's weird. Listen, you can say it out loud. <laughs> I've known it a long, long time. Because I'm somebody who really, 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 really wants results. Okay, I, 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 I've been around playing church enough. Am I in trouble? This guy's got to go. Sorry, I'm not saying I wasn't speeding, but I had to get all the way to the gym and back and all. So, uh, so anyway, because I am passionate about it, a couple things. Number one is I don't care about people's conceptions of how I'm supposed to do that. I, 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 want to, I want to do what works, and, and what we've been doing isn't working, or what I've been doing isn't working, I want to do something else. So if I want you to get it, and I think you'll get it better, if I put a whiteboard up here, and you know, I'm going to put a whiteboard up here. When I teach at our church, I've got a TV set, it's on my left, I've got a TV set right here. And it, my scripture's right there, and I point to the words I want them to notice. And because I, 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 whatever it takes, I want you to get it. That also makes me cantankerous, in the worst sense of the word. And I got pet peeves all over the place. And one of my pet peeves, let me, let me, let me give you this. I hope you haven't said this. If you had, I'm about to correct you. <laughs> Is I hear Christians say this, God will never lay on more on me than I can bear. God will never lay more on me than I can bear. And there's only one problem with that statement. It's hogwash. <laughs> it is completely and utterly true. I have never met a single good, solid Christian who hasn't had numerous times in their lives where God hasn't laid on them more than they can bear. I, I believe it's A.W. Tozer says, if you're based on paraphrasing, I, that you never get good wine unless you crush the grape. And uh, this is actually Tozer. God can never use a person greatly unless he's hurt them deep. Okay, so here's what's going on. Because what'll happen is I'll, I'll say that I'll say, oh, you know, God will put more on you than you can bear. You can just if you're committed to Him, He's gonna put more on you than you can bear. And they come back and they they, they come back with First Corinthians ten thirteen it says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful; He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And they say, see, it says right there, he won't tempt you more than you can bear. And I said, that has nothing to do with trials. That has nothing to do with troubles. One of the biggest, this is this, I'm just going to teach you tonight, I hope you don't mind, I'm just going to teach you something that is invaluable. Because there's two things that go on in your life, they happen all the time. And if you don't tell them apart, you're going to get messed up. And those two things, which are my work, because I've got my stuff here, are trials. Anybody see that? Yes. Okay. By the way, if you're going to complain about this, you better not be sitting in the back. Don't say <laughs> Okay? And we tend to confuse these two things and treat them as the same thing. And they are, in fact, polar opposites. Let me, let me read you in James. The book of James starts out, and he's going to nail it to us. And if you want to, it's in James chapter 1. And he starts out in with everybody's favorite verse in chapter two, chapter one, verse two. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Pure joy when you face trials. Everybody got that? That's 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 how I feel. I mean, I don't know about you. Things are going wrong. I'm looking for. I, it's, I'm just excited and happy. Flat tires. I love flat tires. <laughs> right. I, I love when you go into the into the garage and there's a leak. You have no idea what it is. I just love that, right? <laughs> you know, 
We got, I tell you about Daisy, our dog, the escape artist that looks like a kangaroo rat deer, right? <laughs> to bring you a picture. You don't believe me. She does look like that. We had a special halter for her, and she's got a, a, a puppy partner in crime that's my daughter's dog, Cece. And they like to escape and be gone for days, and not for days, but for a long time. So we had Cece in the, in the house, and Daisy escaped. We blocked it all so, so Cece couldn't escape too. And Cece got hold of Daisy's heart halter and chewed it, and chewed it whole. <clears throat> my daughter don't need a new dog. Uh, Trots, I love them, don't you? Okay. <laughs> So he consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And in verse 12, he finishes the thought. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised for those who love him. In verse 13, he shifts gears. Okay? He says, when tempted, trials, temptations. We just changed. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to, you know what the next word is? Death. 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 Mm. So, what's the what's, what's trial? Bad things happening. Let's be very specific about this. To me. It's not a trial when bad things happen to Russell. I mean, it's not a trial. I mean, I mean well, I might like, like pray for him, but it's not a trial. Bad thing happens to me. That's very specific, very important to get that part. When bad things are happening to me. What's the temptation? I want to do bad things. Right? <clears throat> Simple as that. Those are not the same thing. Not even close to the same thing. Me wanting to do a bad thing has nothing to do with anything bad is happening to me. And what I want to do is I want to show you the difference because you have to, you, if you're going to get this right, you have to look at something in your life and go, is that a trial or is that temptation? Because we're going to see in a little bit, your response is exactly the opposite based on which it is. <clears throat> if you try to respond to temptations like they're trials, you're going to be in a mess. Okay? And especially if you try to do the, if you do what you're supposed to do for temptations and trials, it will mess you up completely. Because I got some bad news. Let's start with the source of these things. Where do temptations come from? You weren't paying attention. You were listening to Flip Wilson. <laughs> oh, does old. <laughs> no. What, 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 did, what, did, what did James just say? Yeah. Each person, verse 14, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. The source of your, most of your temptation, or my temptation, to keep us pronoun the same, is me. I, what, I, what I like to say at our church is we're all screwed up. Everyone, for me, everybody, we're all screwed up. You are a screwed up person. And one of the things that makes you screwed up is you like doing bad things. You're drawn to them, you're attracted to them, you do them, and you do them over and over. You even have favorite bad things. I should call them sins, but I'm being nice to you right now. Okay? You have sins that you prefer over other sins. You have sins that you have more trouble with than other sins. We talked about that last night. I don't have any trouble with stealing. I got trouble with other things. I got a red beard because of my red hair. Temper matches the hair. Okay? So, and we all have the things, the bad things that we want to do. Now, sometimes it is, it's not always Satan helps. I'll go, I'll give him a, a subcredit on that one. Okay? Because remember, Jesus 
was taken out into the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil. That's in there. Can I freak you out just a second? This is one of the freakiest things in the whole Bible. Is why did Jesus go out into the into the desert to be tempted? The Bible says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. You can just dwell on that one a while. I'm not going to talk about it any, but I want you to just temptation is part of life, okay? And it comes from in you, and it comes from the outside stuff. It comes from you know the fact that I like looking at things I'm not supposed to look like look at, and that they like to put up billboards about the things I don't like that I'm not supposed to look at. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, just this is free. This is free. Um, our advertising industry in America, you know what's built on? Temptation. It's built totally. I mean, well, about eighty percent of it's on temptation, tempting you to either do things you shouldn't do or trust things you shouldn't trust. Have you noticed the car commercials haven't been about cars for years? There hasn't been a car commercial that has anything to do with a car for as long as I can remember. Cars, are, the, the, the advertisement is to make you happy or satisfied or safe. Things that cars can't do. But all of us about that. About the, to take, that's, so Satan's working in our culture. Where trials come from? Some of that. Let, let's look at Hebrews 12 because it, this is another. Hebrews talks about the same concept. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, start in verse 5. It's another one of those that starts out funny. It says, Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. The word of encouragement, don't make light of discipline. That's like James said, you know, count it all joy when you fall into trials. They, they, they use words differently than I use them. My son, do not like, make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardships. What would be another word for hardships? Trials. Right. Endure, endure hardships as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate. Not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of us spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, listen to this, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Now, the source of our troubles, and this is going to sound weird, and I've got to explain it just a touch. The source of your trials is God. Now, I'm not saying he's causing them, but God's in control. And my phrase is, if it got to you, God let it through. Okay? There is nothing that comes into your life that God is not allowing into your life. So you can say that every problem, while not caused by God, God doesn't give you cancer, does, God doesn't cause those issues, God allows them in your life. Now, we don't like to say that because we, we want a sunny God, right? We want the bright sunny, make us happy all the time God. Let me ask you a question. Do you know any parents who were make their kids happy all the time parents? How their kids turn out? <laughs> right? If you want to find them, they're easy to find. Go to Walmart and listen. Okay? Those are the, the parents who never let anything bad happen to their kids. As a matter of fact, there's a huge, huge movement right now. They're calling them snowplow parents. I'm talking to the teachers about it. And snowplow parents are those who try to plow all the problems out of their kids' lives. Teachers are going crazy. Anybody's a teacher, you know what I'm talking about. Those, the, 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 the parents who are coming in, you gave my child a B. You're going, your child earned a C. I was being nice. 
but they just try to plow all the problems and the kid doesn't know how to handle problems and that kid's going to grow up to be I don't want to think about it right yeah brat brat is the nice easy term for it right okay so these trials are bad things that are happening to me but God's in control of them and he has a purpose for it it's not just me it's discipline right what did, what did we see? We saw some verses, James 1 4. It said, when he was talking about trials, count it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you fall into trials of many kinds, for you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And then he says, let's perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, what, what's the result of those things? Maturity. God wants you to grow up. And the only way you'll grow up is to figure out how to handle problems. Right? That makes it just nod and say amen. amen. Say, I don't like this. Steve, Steve moved to something else. I'm not enjoying this at all. You're supposed to tell me how to get out of problems. The problem is, <laughs> getting out of problems is not the point. Okay? Hebrews 12, 11, we also read, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of the word he uses is righteousness and peace. Anybody like to have righteousness and peace in your lives? Yes. Would that is that's that something you would like? Okay, what's the path to righteousness and peace? Trials and tribulations. That's the path to maturity. I'm gonna put that up here. And peace. I'm not gonna put it up well, but I'm gonna put it up. That's the path God uses, and you'll find this throughout the Bible. God uses problems in your life to make you into the person he wants you to be. And the bigger the problem, the more he's working. Okay? I'll, 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 I, can, I can tell you a story. Why not? Um, I was in Philadelphia. I had gone up there to be an assistant pastor at a church. It did not end well various reasons, and uh, some, some are my fault, and as at the end of it, I had come, I had been an assistant pastor, I hadn't been speaking a lot, and I had decided I'd be okay not being a preacher anymore, just being an assistant pastor, doing those kind of work, and I was, I convinced myself of that, and then the pastor who was getting rid of me had me speak for five weeks in a row because he was, his sister was sick, and I got to preach for five weeks in a row, and after five weeks, I'm like, I can't ever not do this again. This is, this is, I'm having too much fun with this. And so, somebody slipped in one of those five weeks and their church needed a pastor. And they called me. It was a, it was a medium-sized church. And they, they, they hard meet with the, the committee, you know, there's, there's, you guys haven't done that, but see, you've been here since, since Moses was a little boy. But, uh, <laughs> there's, there's this thing called candidating and all this. You guys don't have any idea how this works, but, you know, you have some, some churches eventually, occasionally, have to find a new pastor. And, and so you guys have been blessed. You just have no idea. Just, let me tell you, you have no idea how blessed you are. And so, anyway, so they're, they're, I'm talking to them. I'm going to there. And I, I spoke at the church a couple of times, and it was going great. And 11 o'clock at night, I get a phone call from the head of the committee. And he said, we've decided that we love you, but there are people in this church who will not. And we don't want to fight them. And I, I'm not making this up. I was literally in the fetal position under my dining room table at midnight. Going, I got three kids. I got a wife. I got, and I, and I got to do this. I turned down a couple options to be an assistant again. I thought, I can't do that again. I have to do this. That's the stuff God does to make you into somebody you can actually, especially, especially, this is, I know this is a fact, if you're stubborn. Because if, if, you're, if you're carving clay, you use your thumb. If you're carving granite, <laughs> dynamite. <laughs> exactly. God had to use a lot of dynamite on me to get even remotely usable. Okay? <laughs> So God's going to be doing this because he wants you to have the maturity. He wants you to have the peace. He wants you to be somebody that can actually accomplish something for him. As a matter of fact, he, he used the concept. He, 
he quoted in Proverbs about discipline. You know, Hebrews was talking about discipline. He's disciplining you. Which brings in Proverbs 22, 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. You could say folly is bound up in the heart of a child of God. But the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Anybody been disciplined by God? And what you tend to do at that point is say, God must not love me. Because you've got all these preachers out there saying, if God loves you, he's going to make everything nice for you. Which again, that's just bad parenting. Right? That's bad parenting. If you're going through a serious trial, that's not a sign that God doesn't love you. It's a sign that he does. It's not a sign that he has no hope for you. It's a sign that he has big hope for you. He has the more the trial, the more the plans, the more he sees potential in you. Right? So that's what's going on in your life. But, okay, let's go back and talk about a couple things. When you get in trials, there's two things you can do with a trial. You can get better or you can get bitter. Okay? You choose that. Don't let anybody tell you different. I've, I've met people who've been through this much, and they're bitter, and they're complaining all the time, and they're just miserable. And I've met people who've been through a lot more, and they got better. So, um, again, I'm cantankerous. I'm allowed to be, because I guess I'm allowed to be. I'm not sure. You're not going to get sympathy for me <laughs> if you're choosing to be bitter about what God brought you through. Because God's giving you a gift. Count it, what? Pure joy. And God brings you trials into your life. Because He is working something good in your life. And He cares enough about you to discipline you as a father disciplines his child. Right? Does that make sense? Matter of fact, I've got the truth down. In God's economy, Trials are a good thing. And do you know what you're supposed to do when you're in the middle of a trial? Endure. Now, what do you want to do? Run away, give up, whatever you can to get out of it. Right? Just, I, don't, I, just, I, just, I do the same thing. You're in the middle of things going wrong. What are you praying to God? God, help! Give me out! God must not love me. He didn't give me out. God must love you. He didn't get you out. Now, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because he's with me. It's not I'm through the valley. Not get me out of the valley. Through the valley. When he's when he out of the valley, when the valley's over. Yeah, right, you know? He, you're going through, this, this was the valley, when would I be through? When I hit those doors back there. Okay? If I go this way, I didn't go through the valley. But through the valley, chat with him. Through the valleys that he brings me through. My job is to endure, not to run away. Now, that's going to get really important in just a second. Well, let's go ahead and talk about temptations. Because what do you want to do when you get tempted? You want to grab it. Right? right. When, you're, when you're over here with the, the trials, you want to run away from a trial. That's how you can tell a trial from temptation at some level. is a trial, you want to run away. Temptation? Let's see just how close I can get to this one. Right? I'm going to see if she didn't even know I'm doing this. <laughs> Right. That temptation, that temptation's there. I'm going to go, save here? How about here? How about here? How close can I get to that? that, that I, know, I, I know it's a bad thing, but how close, how, clo how close can I get to that? You know, because, you know, I'm not going to gossip, but, I, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about it in love. <laughs> right? You know, we're going to see just, you can tell. It, it's definitely a temptation if you're drawn toward it, if you want to move toward it. But, God wants us to do when we hit a temptation? Run away, run away, run away. Uh -huh. Flee is the word. Uh -huh. Timothy, to Timothy, he said twice, flee the evil desires of youth. And then the other time he said, but you man of God, flee from all this. Just run away. 
uh, I, I showed you 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape. Why? You want a temptation does to you? What's temptation lead to? Death. Death. Oh, death. Good old death. Man, that's what James said, right? Right? After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Matter of fact, what's the wages of sin? You've heard that one? Death. Okay? So, do you see the big difference here? This one, I want to run away, and my job is to stay. Right? This one, I want to cuddle up to it, and my job is to run away. <clears throat> so, it's really important that you get this straight. Am I talking about trials, or am I talking about a temptation? This thing that's in my life that is bothering me, is this a trial, or is it a temptation? Because if I get it wrong... I got a problem. Because I'm running away from something that God wants me to walk through. Or I'm cuddled up next to something that God wants me to run away from. And so when we mix those two up, when we start saying, God's never going to put more on you than you can bear, it is. But He's never going to put you in a temptation you don't have the ability to walk away from. Are, are, you, are you following me? Okay. I got a couple things I want to talk to you more about, if you don't mind. Because I want to help you with the fleeing part. Because what you're supposed to do here is flee, right? Can I give you two pieces on how to flee? You're okay with that? Okay. Okay. Ephesians, this is this is crucial. One of the most important things I think in Christian law is what Paul talks about in Ephesians. He does it over and over and over again. And what he says, let me just read you one up in Ephesians 4. Turn to Ephesians 4 if you want, if you want to turn. Because <clears throat> i got a couple of these I'll read to you. He sets up with the general principle in Ephesians 4, verse 22. <clears throat> you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted in its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self, Created to be like God in the righteousness, in true righteousness and holiness. Now, I think I mentioned this. I had to work out this afternoon. I had a day and I just had to go work out. So I didn't eat with you guys. I went to the gym and you guys were eating and I was doing burpees and bear crawls and stupid things like that. And when I got done, you don't want to know the clothes I was wearing. Because I have. I, said, I, said, I think I said like there, there, are things, there are things I'm good at. There are things I'm not. And there are things I'm good at. One of the things I'm really, really, really good at is sweating. <laughs> I am. I am a world champion sweater. Okay. And so when I get done, I've got this headband on, and its purpose is to keep the sweat out of my eyes, and it's failing by the end because it's just too much for it to keep up with. And I get done, and I have a shirt on that is now a liquid. Okay? And I actually will take that shirt off, put let dry, try to dry for a second or two, put another shirt on that I will then sweat through. Okay? Now, I wanted to come here with you nice folks, and I've got on a shirt that is liquid, shorts that are liquid, other things that are liquid, <laughs> socks that are a pair of shoes that are... Now, what am I going to do before I come see you guys? take a shower, and then I'm going to take off the dirty clothes, and I'm going to put on the new clothes. Now, that's that's basic common sense, right? That's just, and everybody going, Slater, that was the dumbest thing you've told us the entire time, because that was so commonsensical. But then, Paul starts, this, he starts clarifying a little bit. In verse 28 is, is one of my favorite examples. He said, who has been stealing must steal no longer. Take it off. That stinky stealing that you're doing, quit it. Take it off. That's that's the first step. When you're sinning, quit it. That's, write that down. Okay? But must work 
doing something useful with his own hands. Take off stealing, put on work. Oh. And then he says that he may have something to share with those in need. So quit taking from others. Go get a job. Work, create something, and then give it to people who need it. Take it off. Put it on. What's your temptation? Take it off. Put something. Put the right thing on. He does it again with, with words. Do not let any unwholesome talk, verse 29, come out of your mouths. Take off bad words. Take off mean words. Take off things that tear people down. The words you say that are destructive, take those off. And But put on what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Because if you think about it, negative words are almost always aimed at somebody to tear them down. When I say negative things, I'm going to say things, bad things about you. You know, that's what, that's what negative words are. Quit saying negative things. Take that off. Put on positive words. And now start saying positive things to people. God showed me that in a big way. I hope you don't mind me telling you a few stories. Um, I grew up and I grew up in a humorous family. I know you're not going to believe that. <laughs> and I, I've... I've always been funny. I mean, I don't know. It's just part of it's a family tradition. We do humor, but for most of my life, my humor my, well, not most anymore, but in the end of my teens, my humor was mean. You know, somebody had a mean sense of humor. I could spot your weakness and I could make fun of it, and you didn't walk away feeling good about yourself. And God got hold of me between my second and third year of college, and He took um, it's verse in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And God took that verse in my life and he just ripped me from the inside out and changed me completely as a human being. And I went back to college and all my friends were going, what happened to Steve? And later I began to see what happened to Steve was instead of me finding the negative in you and teasing you, I found out that people are, are that they don't like me teasing them about their stuff. They don't mind me teasing me. So I, I make jokes about me. You don't care. You don't get upset about me making jokes about me. Right? So I put on wholesome stuff. And then I discovered that all of you have things that you're okay with me teasing you about. There are things you're fine with, especially if it's a string. And if I start talking about, you know, you know, teasing Russell about being tall, he doesn't really get upset about that. Right? Most people have a few things in their lives that they're good, they're, they're cool with, they joke about, I'll find those things and I'll make fun of those. So what I'm doing is I'm building other people up. And God did that work in my life. But I took off the negative and put on the positive. Take off the negative. See, what happens is, it's a bad idea. You take off the negative, you quit doing the bad thing, but you don't replace it with anything. Just walking around naked and nobody's happy with this. Right? Jesus talks about, you know, if you drive out a demon, and if you don't bring something positive in, it just brings back bigger demons. Brings its friends back. And that's what happens not in just with demons, but just with evil. You, you, I'm going to quit doing that. You quit doing that and don't replace it with something good. It just gets worse. When you find that negative thing in your life, that sin, that temptation that is constantly hitting you. Matter of fact, do you remember what um, what Paul said? If you have trouble with lust, bring that on a plane. If you have trouble with lust, you know what he said? The response was? No, that's not Paul. <laughs> Paul wasn't nearly as vicious as Jesus. No. You know, you know what the cure was? Get married. That's 1 Corinthians 7, 9. If, if you cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Take off the negative use of, of, of the sexuality. Put on the positive. Same concept. Over and over and over and over. So, we're fleeing it. We're preparing for it. So, we're not getting tempted. Now, I've got one more thing I want to share with you that is just interesting, I think. You mind one more thing? 
there's, there's another piece that plays into this one, and it's huge in our culture. And it's not trials and temptations, it's tired. Because tired impacts both of these very strongly. Anybody done anything wrong after midnight they might not have done wrong before midnight? <laughs> Tired comes into your temptations and it magnifies them. It makes you weaker. You're not able to stand against the bad things as well. And so you give in more easily. What does tired do to your trials? Oh, they're so much worse. Oh, I so want to quit. Oh, I so don't want to endure because I'm tired. You know, sometimes, I didn't say this, but I forget who did. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. I do that all the time. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we catch Jesus taking that nap on the storm on the sea, I'm like, I can be like Jesus. So I go home and practice what I preach after that one every time. But it's true. A lot of times, you're stressed out. So you quit sleeping. So the trials get worse, the temptations get harder, and you get stressed so you're not sleeping. And you're wired up, and you're stressed, and you're not sleeping. And everything gets worse, and everything gets worse, and everything gets worse. And you know what the problem is? I can tell you, you're not going to like the problem. You know why most of the time you're not sleeping? Because you're too stressed. Why are you stressed? Because you have a trial going on, and you, you don't look to it. You're not trusting God. Right? Okay. As long as you trust God, though, you don't have all those things. Because, because the Bible says that God gives sleep to those He loves. He does love me a lot. My, my wife has learned that about me. She learned it years and years ago. We'll, we'll be doing something. She'll see me because I'm starting to get ornery. And she'll say, you need a nap. <laughs> and, and I'll go take a nap. And when I come out, I've got a fresh perspective on things. I'm not as discouraged. I'm not as falling for temptation as much. I'm doing better in my trials. Because I'm not as stressed because I'm trusting God enough to sleep. There's a, let, me, let me throw one more piece at you. Close. Unless it's just less than I would have after that. Um, there's something I see a lot of in our culture, and that is what did Paul say? He said, I don't have it written down, I'm not going to try to memorize it, and I'm not good at this. But he says, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things, we'll look that up and give me, there's a whole list of them. And he, he goes through the whole list of things. If what sort of things are good, true, noble, just, da 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 da, think on these things. Think on these positive things. And then what's it? You remember what it says next? Now you guys, some of you guys know your Bible pretty well. Then the God of peace will be with you. I'm gonna be honest with you. I see Christians, and they start having these downward thoughts, and the first thing they do is run to the doctor to get a get a prescription, or they start self-medicating. Or they start reading some self-help book. <clears throat> or they start. The Bible says, and I have this thing about the Bible, I kind of believe it. Now, I'm kind of a believer in the book. And the book says that if I will take these positive thoughts, if I will make sure that I'm rested, and I will think the positive thoughts, I'll intentionally think the things that are true and noble, that I'll think through those things, that the God of peace will be with me. And I really think, and I believe this very sincerely, that we could, as Christians, stop taking as much medication. I hope I'm, well, I kind of hope I am stepping on somebody's toes in a very gentle way. <laughs> we could stop having as much medication we need to take. We could be a lot less stressed if we just do what he says. And the things that are true, the things that are noble, the things that are pure, the things that are right, if we would stop and catalog and think about those things. There is times that I don't sleep. When I have those times, you know what I do? I read the Bible. And then I go to sleep. The Bible puts you to sleep? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not saying you know, Phil, you're about as big a troublemaker as Phyllis is, I'm thinking. 
that's what I'm thinking here. Read the Bible, go. She said she reads the Bible to go to sleep. I heard her say that.
an invitation right there. Yeah. Would you stand with me? We're going to close, very simple. Very simple here. If there's anyone here tonight that you don't know the Lord Jesus, you don't know the very power that can deliver you from temptation and help you to endure whatever trials you're facing in your life, we hope you will not leave here without asking Jesus to come into your heart. And uh, Reverend Davis and myself will be here beyond the amen. Uh, Brother Ted would, would welcome uh, you. If you want to speak to him or just somebody in this sanctuary that you know knows the Lord. If you don't know the Lord or you have a doubt as to where you stand with Christ in relationship to what he's done for you, we would love that opportunity to talk with you, pray with you. Knowing Christ as your Savior. Of course, revival is primarily for the people of God. And I know that we, we were listening. We heard something that we can take with us tonight to where we're going to be revived and we're going to walk with the Lord and we're going to shine the light of Jesus to others, even in the midst of our troubles. Amen? Amen. And God will use even our troubles to reach others. Amen. Let's pray. And before we pray, remind you. Now, tomorrow night, we're going to have another meal, so come, come hungry, and uh, you let those folks who you saw getting the meal ready, let them know how much you appreciate them here in the okay? And also, a special treat tomorrow night, special music. Kim Davis, Steve's wife, is going to sing a couple of beautiful songs to minister to our hearts before this meets tomorrow night, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you, Lord, how you just reminded us what was already there in your word. Help us to, Father, take what we've heard. If we need to, go back and search the Scripture some more until we've seen it and we see that for ourselves, Father, and we can, we can claim the truths and the principles of what you have clearly laid out for us in the Word so that we will be those enduring people. Those people, Jesus said, those who endure to the end will be saved. So, Father, give us endurance, Lord, when we go through the troubles and the trials that we face. Help us to run away and flee from, as the Bible says, those things that we want to go do that are bad for us, Father. Thank you that you have a purpose and you have a plan and you have a will that's perfect. But help us to walk in that plan, Father, tonight and until we see you, Father, in heaven. We love you. Bless us as we leave. Bring us back again, Father, so we may hear another message from you tomorrow night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.